sorry it took so long to get here, but uh, but it's it's very nice to be here in Miami, and this is a great community, and I'm really excited to be a part of it. Uh, the story I want to tell you today is about how the post has changed. Maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but the post ownership changed in October of 2013. The Washington Post was bought by Jeff Bezos, not Amazon, but Jeff Bezos and his wife Mackenzie personally. <laughs> I, I like them, they seem great, from what little I know. No, but it, it really is an interesting story of how an analog business primarily can go and become a digital business and really very much be transformed not just in the work that we do, but frankly in the way that we reach our audience, in the way that we deal with our customers, and even in the kinds of issues we can cover. And I think the trick for the post, which is not entirely unusual for a business that's 140 years old, is that our identity was very much tied up in our heritage. And in a way, that's a great thing. That was a very powerful brand identity. So did anyone see the movie The Post that came out relatively recently? OK, a couple people. So we were thrilled that Tom Hanks wanted to pay Ben Bradley. We were thrilled that people might have remembered Jason Robards playing Ben Bradley. But the truth is, The Post, by October 2013, really had to be more than just the newspaper of Ben Bradley. Not because that legacy wasn't important, but because that legacy could not define our future as well as our past. And so today we're really lucky that we have a very dynamic and different newsroom headed by Marty Baron, who you might remember from Spotlight. Uh, he was the ex so, sorry? Or the Miami Herald, of course, right, and the New York Times, but especially here in Miami. And um, this was Marty's moment in Vanity Fair, which he would never admit to, but he has said that he believes that all journalists, especially reporters, are motivated by either envy or ego or both. And this might have been his ego moment, and I will say my ego moment was, that's me. So I was in Vanity Fair one year, but I was in Vanity Fair. And um, so from my vantage point, observing what's going on, and I, I work in the newsroom, but really my job is, is equal parts journalism and storytelling, technology and strategy and revenue. And I think a few years ago, that kind of a job wouldn't exist in the newsroom. It wouldn't be a person who works for Marty Baron. But today, in the post as we are, that very much is a part of who we are and what we do. So just to kind of scale things, um, 350,000 people do still read the printed Washington Post, which is great. Uh, it's down pretty significantly from more than half a million a few years ago, uh, but it, it still matters. On the other hand, today more than 10 million people on every day read the Washington Post digitally, and sometimes 15 or more million people are seeing us across a variety of platforms. And so really, as an organization, we don't talk about ourselves as a newspaper. We're a news organization, and a newspaper is part of what we do. And this is the crucial part of the story, is how do we go from being a news organization that primarily published a newspaper to a news organization that also publishes in a newspaper. And a big part of that is trying to define ourselves not as our distribution channel. And I think the lesson here for any business is that you have to really understand what it is you do. In your heart of hearts, if we had believed that we were a newspaper, that would color everything else we did. And when we think about, for example, the other ways that we publish, these are all owned and operated platforms of the Post. For example, last year we sent out 982 news alerts from our main news channel alone, you know, iOS, Android. We have three or four, depending on how you count, different applications that are available on Kindle, Android, iOS, and others. In publishing the website, it actually turns 22 this summer, so it's not like digital publishing was brand new to us. But even things like email newsletters are a very fast-growing part of our business. And the way that we work with audio, not just podcasts, but smart speakers, is really transformative. But at the end of the day, the thing that's really important to the Post newsroom is that we do not define ourselves, and there is no person who works on just one of these channels. That really what everyone in the newsroom is doing is gathering stories. And this is really critical, that we as an organization, what we make are stories. The platforms that I show you here, these are just the ways we get those stories into the hands of people who might care. And that really is the key part of the organizational change that we went through. And in truth, the owned and operated platforms are a big part of what we do, but it's not really all of what we do. That we publish every day in the way that we reach more than 10 million people digitally is by publishing on virtually every channel. 
that for an international audience, Viber and WhatsApp are every bit as important as Facebook is for our domestic audience and the newspaper is for the loyal readers in the DC area. And that when we think about our relationships between the stories, it's not as if we really favor our owned and operated platforms over any platform. That our job and our goal is to tell the right story in the right way on the right platform for that specific member of the audience. And the way that we got to this place, which is pretty important and was frankly a pretty difficult transition to make, is that we had to change the jobs of virtually everyone in the newsroom. And so at the Post, and you can probably imagine why, we do most of our training in odd numbered years, which also happen to be non-election years. And so first in 2015, we took every one of our reporters, and these days there are about 500 of them, and we train them on social distribution. So for example, you should find no story published by the Washington Post that doesn't have a social share image. Because that's really critical. It's critical to the understanding of what the story is about, even if it is primarily a text-based story, to see something that is accurate and explanatory about your story. And just to give you a sense of the transition that we're talking about, at the same period that we were trying to train these reporters, we were also trying to go from publishing about 200 stories a day to today publishing between three and 400 stories every day. So we're publishing a lot more stories. We're publishing them very differently. We're asking very different things of our reporters, but we're demanding the same or hopefully higher levels of quality. And so this is very difficult. Now this particular set of examples, who, what, when, where, why, and how, if you went to journalism school or ever did any reporting, you may remember this, was how we actually taught our assigning editors. So we have about 200 assigning editors. And in uh, 2017, we took each of them out of the work, work day for about two days. And we said, you need to think about your audience. This used to be so easy. Every newspaper knows their audience. It's the people to whom they deliver the paper. And the beauty of that is that when you get the newspaper, you don't really have a choice. It's not like you can say, oh, today I got the Washington Post, but tomorrow I'd like USA Today or the New York Times or the Miami Herald or the New Times. You get the paper you get and you're pretty stuck with it. On the other hand, digitally, every day you decide whether you're going to look at us or not. Every day. And so thinking about who your audience is, how you're going to reach that audience, and what you have to offer them is absolutely crucial. And so what we did is we said to every one of our assigning editors, each of whom run somewhere between three and seven reporters, so they're helping to identify the stories, they're helping to determine which stories to tell, you need to decide who you are trying to reach. And in truth, our assigning editors were pretty resistant to this. They said, our job as journalists is not to decide who we're reaching, it's to decide which stories we're telling. And we said, well, that's true, but it's not wholly true. It's not wholly true in the sense that if you don't think about who you're trying to reach, you're not going to pick the right stories, you're not going to tell those stories in the right way, and you certainly aren't going to participate on the right social channels because you're not worried about that at all. And so what we had forced them to do is talk about what topics they would cover, and equally importantly, what topics they wouldn't cover. We had them think about what the tone of that should be like, what format, meaning what storytelling styles that story should use. We had them think about their audience's habits. So for example, historically, the Washington Post education team had covered DC, Maryland, and Virginia. They went to school board meetings. They attended school events. They talked about what was happening in those schools. And as we wanted them to think nationally about their story, they had to think about what they cover and what they don't cover. And so sometimes that means hard choices about a school board event with nothing particular on the agenda. Maybe we don't go. They had to think about what kinds of topics are uncovered right now. What are their competitors not doing? So for example, we started covering for-profit colleges, which we effectively thought there was no news coverage of. And then really importantly was thinking about the audience's habits. Because if you think about parents and you think about teachers, they don't have a ton of time during the day, which is some of our busiest news gathering and production time. When they have time is after their kids are in bed, after they're done grading. And it's then that we publish our most important education stories, because that's when the audience is available to read them. And so then we can be the most recent thing in their newsfeed, whether it's on Facebook or in Google News, because we're publishing at a time that they might be receptive to that journalism. And the truth is, and this is the hardest part for our editors, that when they come up with these audience strategies, and these are done in conjunction with their department heads and with the leadership at the Post, that really, if they're absolutely successful with their audience strategy, they will still have to change it. Because their competitors will copy them. 
And if they're ineffective, they'll have to change it anyway. And so these strategies that we create are continually evolving. Because if they don't, they won't be successful. So all of this comes back to the storytelling. The storytelling is very much at the heart of what we do. In fact, we're trying very hard to get our reporters to think differently about their own jobs, not just about the mechanics of how they share their stories, but even what it means to be a reporter. That maybe not for you, but for many of them, the idea of being a reporter is co-joined with being a writer. But those two things automatically go hand in hand. And in truth, that's not the way we want them to think about their reporting. The reporting is the gathering of the information. We have all kinds of different ways we can tell those stories. And in some cases, we want to tell different versions of these stories for different audiences. Some stories are meant to be told in video. Some stories need illustration. Some stories can be long and immersive. Other stories need photos and graphics. And some stories are primarily audio stories. And so we try very hard to think about what are the facts what do we have? When should we publish it? Who are we publishing for? And then what way or ways make the most sense to tell that story? And what we believe in very strongly is experimentation. Because just like your audience strategy, the means of telling those stories, the tools we use, have changed. They've changed dramatically. The kinds of reader involvement we seek, whether it's comments or social channels, in a, a whole series we did on workplace issues and salary, we built out a Slack channel that was totally dedicated to that topic. And the audience helped us shape future coverage by participating in an ongoing conversation, sometimes with post journalists, sometimes with each other. And that was absolutely fine. That was a very successful interaction for us. And so what we do for these experimental approaches to storytelling is we build ad hoc teams. That's really critical for two reasons. One. You don't necessarily know, if you have a dedicated team that tells stories in one way, what new thing will happen. And the second thing is, it doesn't help with disseminating the idea of experimentation, the idea of innovation in your organization, if only a few people get to do it. So as much as possible, we're trying to bring people, there are about 800 people in the newsroom, we're trying to bring as many of them into the experimental journalism we do as possible. We have about, these days, 200 engineers, about half of whom sit in the newsroom alongside journalists. And by engineers, I mean basically developers, although they would tell you there's a slight difference. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, they would say that. And what we try to do is build out these teams that tackle project after project. Some members are holdovers from previous projects. Some members are totally different. That the reporters whose expertise in a subject area we're using are a critical component but so too are the developers and the designers and the graphic artists. And together, we can build out new ways of telling stories. And I'll show you some examples in a second. Uh-oh. I think I broke it. Oh, that's all right. And uh, I don't know. I think Spacebar was. Here, let's try to go back one. That's fine. I'll just hit Spacebar. Um, and so when we come back to the storytelling, a big part of what has changed at the Post is the infusion of journalism and technology together. That we don't really think about the journalism as separate from the technology, and that in some cases, if you came to our newsroom, you would not be able to tell the difference, maybe in dress a little bit, between the engineers and the journalists. And in some cases, the journalists are now writing code, especially front end, and the engineers are in some cases asking journalistic questions. And what that's led us to is ARC. And ARC is the content management system. It's really a suite of tools that the Post built for itself, and we now license out. So if any of you know the story of Amazon and AWS, while not entirely the same, it has some similarities. That we needed world-class tools to practice our daily journalism. And we couldn't find them, so we built them ourselves. And they were good enough that now the Boston Globe um, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Toronto Globe and Mail, about 200 different newspapers and television stations are using the ARC platform. And now we're actually starting to benefit because other ARC clients, not the Washington Post, are asking for features that we didn't think we needed that suddenly the Post gets to benefit from. So now the fact that the platform is not only a dynamic, evolving thing driven by the Post, but actually benefiting from the wisdom of other news publishers is starting to help us. And it's become a critical source of revenue. That now when we think about the Post, the technology aspect of it is no longer just a cost, but actually a revenue center. 
which has really changed the relationship we have about investing in technology. It's not just something that we have to do because we need the technology, but something that we can do and potentially generate revenue that helps pay for the journals we want to produce. And it often solves very elemental problems. So when I talked about how we used to publish 200 stories a day and today we publish 400 stories a day, that puts a tremendous strain on the editorial leadership. Marty Barron, our executive editor, does not believe that he can be the executive editor if he doesn't know every story that's being published. That was virtually impossible. So what did we do? We built a system that allows you to see at a glance every story in draft mode, every story that's been published, every story in every potential state. And the idea wasn't necessarily that this would help us with distribution, but ironically it helps a lot with distribution because now as we publish, if you think about all of the owned and operated channels, all of the other channels that we publish to, it's also difficult to know what stories should populate those channels. And so now different members of our staff can see at a glance all the stories that they might want to share on Facebook, that they might want to put on some of the other verticals that we have, that they might want to include in an email newsletter or send out as an alert. And so now with WebSCED, which is what we call this, we can see all of those things. But it also impacts very basic stuff like staffing. So if you think about a newspaper company, you need all of your designers and your best editors to be working at night because you're trying to get the news in as late as possible so it's as current as possible for the next morning. But if you think about when you as a news consumer actually consume news, it's mostly in the morning. That's very often true for our audience. It's first thing in the morning, it's right before lunch, it's during lunch, it's right after lunch. So if all of your best copy editors and designers were working at night, then your most important stories viewed by the most people digitally are getting the worst editing and design treatment. So now because we have this platform that allows us to see all of our stories, we can start to track trends. And we can say, you know what, this is when you need to publish. And this is when we need to staff our editors and our designers. And so we've gotten much more efficient and effective about telling stories at the right times for the right audiences because we can see the stories in progress. And without being able to measure the, imp the impact of those stories, the journalism would also be much less effective. So we decided we needed tools that went beyond just tonnage metrics, meaning that we don't just care about page views and just care about unique visitors. Those things are important. They have a place in what we do but they are far from the whole story. So we built what we call Spectrum, not the most original name, but it is in fact a Spectrum. This represents about 330 stories that we told on a particular Monday, which is a slower day. Each of the colors represents a different topic. So you've got sports and style and politics and national and opinion and business. And we have, I don't know why the screenshot only has a three, but there are five key criteria that go into our total score. So some, a story with near zero is probably actually just something that we published and then took down or didn't publish. But something that's at a 90 is made up of subscribers and subscriber propensity. So this is a select cut of unique visitors, people who are either already paying digital subscribers or behaving very similar to them. Do you, do you think and talk about the funnel with your businesses? So they're way at the bottom. You know, you're, you're either paid at the bottom of the funnel or just a slice above that. Social sharing which is a really critical endorsement of our journalism by our audience. If you're sharing a story very deliberately, that means that we were successful in some way. Uh, we often talk, we, did, we surveyed our audience, and Pew has done research in the same vein, and people share stories, well, this part is a little painful, but they share stories because it makes them seem smarter. I, I wish they read the journalism because it made them smarter, but they share the stories because it makes them seem smarter, so that's, that's a near two. <laughs> it's true. And then recirculation, which for us means if you look at one story, when you go to a second story, that moves actually kind of opposite from time spent, which we care a lot about, these engagement metrics. How deeply did you read? If you spend, and a typical subscriber for us comes about five times a day for about 90 seconds a time. So if you spend, and I'll show you stories that take six minutes to read. If you spend six minutes with a story, you're obviously not gonna go to a second story. But that's okay, so we're fine with that. So they're weighted accordingly, and then, um, time spent, social share, subscribers, recirculation. Oh, those are the five. And that gets you to your total score. And then what we use Spectrum for is not necessarily to evaluate individual stories. We're not saying you, you as a writer got a 90 or you got a 10 and you're bad or you're good. But rather that we look across time at a topic area and we say, well, these stories have resonated or they haven't resonated. Or we look at all of the stories in the top quartile and the bottom quartile. Because bell curve like, we're interested in why stories don't work or why they do work. And whatever lesson we learn, we can apply that to the middle. 
So the middle stories don't matter so much. And these kinds of tools have really changed how we think about the journalism we do and how we know what works and what doesn't work. But the other thing that we do with data that's really exciting, and two days ago we published a whole bunch more of these stories, is that we complement our human written coverage with algorithmic storytelling. So we talk a lot about speed and scale. So for example, with the Winter Olympics in Korea, in South Korea, we told the story of Zaval, I think there are about 120 events, nearly instantly by taking data from the IOC, from the Olympic Committee, and automatically writing stories off of it. Do you remember Mad Libs? You know, you have a sentence and there's a blank and you fill it in. This is the opposite. So you have a number. We know who won an event, by how much, what country they're from, what their name is, and we know how that compares maybe to the Olympic record or the world record. And then we can write a story based off of the results instantly. And that's really crucial because that kind of a news is absolutely commodity. We sent a dozen reporters to South Korea. We don't want any of those people to ever write a story that everyone else has access to the same data at the same time. In fact, we don't even want them when they go to an event to write about who won necessarily or at least to worry about being first to share that information. Being first matters for a lot of stories. It doesn't matter necessarily for those stories because the only thing that we can do that's different is analyze, add color, ask the right questions. And so if we can use the algorithm to write the results-oriented stories, then those human reporters can do anything but that and add value that we have that nobody else has. And with the elections, it's very similar. Oh, did you have a question? Right, but if those stories are commodities, why do you run them at all? Are the, if those stories are commodities, why run them at all? I, the argument that I would make is that those stories are still valuable information to someone, that you might care to see it on our platform. And so we don't want to say we don't have the results, but we don't want to spend human time during the Olympics on the results. And that's even more true with the elections. With the elections, I think it's especially true. So uh, 2012, the Post covered the presidential election and the congressional, gubernatorial, and senate elections at the same time. We wrote stories about, give or take, 15% of all the races. In some cases, it took 72 hours to finish writing those stories. They were written in many cases off of data from journalists who were not in Iowa's fourth congressional district because Steve King has been elected and Steve or Peter, that representative has been elected and re-elected and will continue to be so. And yet, at that time, we reached maybe on election, on the month of the election, 30 million unique domestic visitors. Today, we're reaching between 80 and 100 million, just depending on the month. And we want to cover every congressional race, every gubernatorial race, and every Senate race, even if they're non-competitive. And so for us, we're going to probably, give or take, have 75 reporters on the field, in the field on election night. And yet we want to tell the stories of more than 500 races. And so to us, it's really important to use the algorithm. In this case, it's not just results oriented, but it's actually branching logic. So we'll look at the race and we'll tell you whether an incumbent won or lost. We'll tell you whether it was close or not close. We'll tell you whether that race impacts the balance of power or doesn't. And then we can geolocate. So you don't have to see all of those stories. You see the stories that are about the place that you're from. And so we look at things like when you open email newsletters, when you check the website, where are you based, and giving you that information. And so for us, these algorithmic stories enable us to tell stories that we otherwise probably wouldn't have, but that we believe still add value. And another, oh, go ahead, please. We are very careful not to do predictive election-related things. Not because we don't think it's important, but we, because, I mean, you, we didn't do it in 2016 either. It's really hard to be in the prediction game. Um, what we will do with not so much Spectrum, but what we call Heliograph, the automated storytelling tool, is we are going to look at what the demographics of the district, meaning income level education, uh, previous voting records, other things like that, and we will try to tell you, infer things about what's going on in the district. And we will do that in competitive races with our human reporters. But with these other races, we will do our best to do that, taking the judgment of the human reporters and converting it to an algorithm. So we will say, in this district that has a lot of, that over indexes for educated and affluent voters, this many votes are still out. And then you can infer whether you think that that helps one party or the other. 
but we try not to do too much in the way of prediction just because we're so, you know, most people are wrong. Are you going to be using both human beings and machines? Absolutely. I mean, there in no way would we ever try, the, the human reporters we have are our greatest asset. So all we want to do is use the algorithms to eliminate road and mundane work and free them up to do other things. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does our algorithm that writes the stories learn? No, not yet. It's a really interesting question. So one of the things that's pretty amazing, is anyone in, uh, would anyone consider themselves working in deep learning or AI? Not, uh, maybe. So the thing that's really fantastic for us is that we have an incredible corpus, right? So we're publishing, we, we publish 400 stories a day. We've been doing it for 140 years. There is a lot that a machine can be trained on. We have not yet gotten to the point that we're training the machine on, on previously written stories. Instead, what we're doing is we're trying to codify our editorial judgment, meaning that, for example, we did this with high school football stories. What's more important? Is it more important that both teams are ranked? Is it more important that one player had a great game? Or is it more important that the outcome was really exciting of the game, like meaning that it was decided on a last minute score? And so we write rules that say this thing takes precedence over that thing, and then we apply this branching logic to make decisions throughout the story based on that. We'd like to move to a place where we could apply deep learning, machine learning, to our existing human written stories and then apply those rules and that logic to our algorithmic written stories. We just haven't quite gotten there yet. Oh, sure. Um, and, and so with this wealth of stories, with the data that we're collecting that we understand, we're starting to approach our own journalism differently. So for example, in the case of the Lily, an art director in our newsroom who happens to be a female millennial user decided that of those hundreds of stories we're publishing every day, there were about a dozen that would be really interesting and valuable to a female millennial audience. So we're not trying to out Jezebel Jezebel, we're not trying to out bustle bustle, we're trying to take the news that we have and make it relevant to an audience that are of a particular demographic slice. And so the Lily publishes between a dozen and two dozen stories a day. They have Lily Lines, which has the highest open rate of any of our email newsletters. It's a once a week email newsletter. They're a team of five or six female millennial staffers who are looking through the news of the day, looking in WebSCED, deciding what stories belong in there, editing them as needed, sort of curating our own site. We are acknowledging, I don't know if you can see in small type, that it is the Lily is the Washington Post, but it has a brand that stands alone. And so they do live installations, they do meetups in a variety of cities, and they're trying to build a community around our journalism for a very specific age group, which we never would have done or could not have done successfully before. And we're experimenting with different platforms pretty aggressively. So when Mark Zuckerberg came to DC to either answer questions or teach senators what Facebook was, this is a little, little of the one, little of the other, um, we decided this would be a great time to launch a Washington Post Twitch channel. Are there Twitch users here? I, I don't know if it's true, but Twitch claims that people on average spend 110 minutes a month on that platform. And so if you're not thinking about Twitch, you should be thinking about Twitch. It's not all gaming, although a lot of it is. And when we took our live feed from Capitol Hill, plus we put some reporters on, plus we assigned one member of our social team to sit in the comments. You don't moderate Twitch, but you can participate in the conversation. Uh, we started the day, we, when, when the hearings went live, we were streaming about 25,000 live views on our website, and we had about 3,800 people on Twitch. And I felt great. No advertising, no promotion, we really hadn't talked about it, we just launched the channel, and there were thousands of people watching. I came back at the end of the day to see how we'd done. 357,000 people had watched our live stream. It's an astonishing audience that we had really not done a lot. I mean, frankly, everything we were doing, almost everything for Twitch except the guy in the social channel, we are also doing for our own live stream. And so we were finding a new audience by experimenting on different platforms. And sometimes we think about the ways we can slice our content around topics. So for example, we have a, an ongoing reader panel of about 3,000 readers and we ask the people who are interested in cooking how relevant the Washington Post recipes were. We've published recipes for, I think, 88 years. We have a whole bunch of them. And when we asked people, we thought part of what made our recipes different was that they were accessible. That even if you weren't a great cook, you could do it. And our audience said, absolutely not. <laughs> if you don't know a lot about cooking, you cannot touch these recipes. And we said, whoa, 
That's a problem. Our own sense of self is completely wrong. And so we launched Voraciously. And Voraciously is a whole channel dedicated to new cooks. Now, many of them are millennials, but not all of them. That's not the idea. It's not specifically for millennials. What it's specifically about, for example, dinner in, a minute, in minutes recipes are all 30 minutes or less. That if we tell you about the ingredients, we also tell you about the techniques you need to prepare them and the tools you might want. So if we say you need a chef's knife, we say here's what an inexpensive one costs and it's a decent one. Here's a mid-priced one and here's what you can spend if you're looking at a top-end one. And we do what we call an asymmetric newsletter, meaning that if you get most of our newsletters, it tells you what happened today and every one of you, at least right now, would get the same thing. In this one, it's like uh, Couch to 5K for cooking. And so the first week, we tell you how to make one dish. By the 12th week, we tell you how to synchronize and time out the dishes you have and throw a dinner party. And so it doesn't matter whether you sign up today or next week or you signed up three months ago, your 12 weeks start when you sign up. And so again, it's a very different way to use the stories we already have. And we're even thinking about audio pretty differently. I mentioned smart speakers. Who has a, an Echo, a Dot, a Tap, a Google Home, a HomePod? Does anyone actually have a HomePod? No, okay, not that one, but all the rest. So. We were pretty excited about audio. We were pretty excited about audio because we got really lucky. And remember I said that most reporters are driven by either ego or envy? A, a handful of our reporters have been podcasting because they like to hear themselves talk, which was great. <laughs> it was great. And so those early podcasters, the production value was really low. They were recording it on their own phone. They were doing it sometimes at their desk. It was horrible. And we learned that people like better quality audio. And so we started getting better. We built out an audio team, and that was going well. Um, but when it came to smart speakers, we realized that's a whole different deal. That you don't necessarily want the same 40-minute podcast that works really well while you're at the gym or you're commuting to work on your smart speaker. Because it doesn't take anyone 40 minutes to make breakfast or coffee. It doesn't. And so our first audio show, we still sort of call it a podcast, but it's not really a podcast. It's called Retropod. It's based off of this historical column we do where we take an event that's happening today, there's been a lot of stuff from 1968 because of the anniversary, and then we, we try to explore the relevance to today through the historical event. But what we do is every episode of Retropod that's released for the smart speakers is four to six minutes long, because that's how long people are actually spending with information. And so by thinking about the length as it relates to the device that you're using, we're getting better. And we're talking about our own stories, because not very far from now, Google is working very hard, for example, to make news the answer to questions you might ask. So if you want to know what's going on with North Korea or what's going on with immigrants at the border, we have the answers to those questions. But we have to look at our stories and we have to understand within our stories what are the answers we have and even more importantly, what questions do those answers answer? Because we have to be able to recognize the questions as it's asked by humans who might say something like, is it going to rain tomorrow, which really means give me a forecast that's focused on precipitation for Miami. And so we can look back on all the journalism that we produce and see what answers it has in it and then what questions people might ask. But by far, the most fun part of my job is the experimentation that we do, infusing technology into the creation and the consumption of our stories. So this is an example of a story we published last week. It's part of a series we do about arts and science. And in this case, what we're looking at is what is going on neurologically as improvisational artists, jazz musicians in this case, and, and uh, and um, comedians, uh, improv comedians, are doing their work. And so what you can see, hopefully, on both the desktop and mobile version, is that these stories are very visual. They're what we call multi-sensory stories, meaning that we combined audio, video, interactive graphics with text. And in both of these cases, these are stories, even on mobile, where people are sometimes spending upwards of four and five minutes. That when we do these longer stories, that are highly visual, that are multi-sensory, not only do people spend time with them, but the shelf life is much greater. So for us, sometimes a very successful news story is only good for 10 minutes. This story can last and be valid and useful to people for months, maybe longer. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about with these kinds of stories, and we're not doing all that many of them, how can we not only experiment with the technology, but use the way we tell the story to engage people more deeply. Here's another good example of something that we published in April about the demographic changes that are, un that are happening in China and India because of selective abortions in the 70s and how there are now many more men in some places than there would normally be and what that means for society. And the challenge is, even though this story is based on a whole bunch of vignettes that we did in reporting in China and India, 
you can't understand it if you don't understand the trends. But rather than dump a bunch of numbers on you, we thought we would not only show you graphs, but we would tell you what to look at on each of those graphs. So that as you scroll, we actually say, here are the things that are worth noting about this. And when we get through this graph piece, then we actually explain to you how the story is going to be developed. So there's four key parts. And we wanted to make sure, because a longer piece of journalism, if you're coming for 90 seconds, you need to know that you're entering it. We actually change the way that you scroll as a way of bookmarking that you're entering a new phase of the story. So you go from scrolling vertically to scrolling horizontally. And we introduce new characters and the new theme of the next section. And only when you get through this stopping moment, then do we start scrolling vertically and go back to the more traditional storytelling. And in some cases, we do all kinds of different ways to tell a very traditional story. So food trucks are a big deal everywhere, but in DC as well. And so we went to some of the food trucks to help people understand that sort of access journalism. Can we take you behind the curtain? And so we did a number of different things. One, we broke down what's inside a food truck. We asked some of our readers, what do they care about food trucks? And one of the things they wondered about is, if a restaurant needs a huge kitchen, how do you cook in a food truck? Well, this is how. And so inside the story, we did all kinds of things, including introducing 360 degree video. But we very deliberately waited until you were already committed to the story to ask you to take action within the video. Because otherwise, you might not think it worth the time to interact with the video in that way. Thank you. And we're using new technologies to help capture stories. So for example, this is a photogrammetry project that we did. And what photogrammetry means, we did this back in October, is we took a statuette at the Smithsonian and we photographed it 127 times on a turntable, so from all angles. And then we stitched it together. And what we created is a 3D digital photo model. And what we really wanted to do is give people the experience we had when we went to the Smithsonian. And the curator pointed out a variety of different things. And so you can see we hyperlink within the story. And then we actually rotate the model so that you see exactly the part of it that we want you to see based on what the story is talking about at that moment. And we can use similar techniques to tell other kinds of stories. So everyone remembers the hurricane that hit Puerto Rico. Right after the hurricane, we sent journalists to Puerto Rico. And we brought drones. We shot 4K video, 30 frames per second. We wanted to show people how severe the mudslides were, how painfully the impact was on the island. And so what we did is we took those 30 frames per second over about 17 minutes. And we built out a 3D model, kind of like we did with the photogrammetry. And then, and this has everything to do with file size, we brought it into Unity, a gaming engine, and we ran a virtual camera through it. The big difference being that with the photogrammetry example, for desktop it was a 20 megabyte file, for mobile it was 3.5 megabytes. Here, this file we're using is 330 megabytes. So it's way too big for most people today to stream and then have control over. But with videogrammetry, we see the ability to potentially take news stories and actually allow our audience to have agency, to move inside these 3D models of these moments captured on video, which is an incredibly powerful experience as bandwidth gets better and you have gigabit connections at home and at work. And we're really pretty bullish right now and excited by augmented reality. And so we built our first story, our first AR story was about two years ago. You had to download another app. You had to point it at something. Basically, nobody did it. And uh, that was painful, but, but true. It was a good story, but badly executed. Today, we built into our native app the ability to have AR stories. So you don't need to do anything. You just point your phone at the ground or at the ceiling. Uh, in the first case, what we did was an architecture story, where in Hamburg, Germany, there's a new concert hall. And in that concert hall, they have acoustical tiles that are designed by algorithm, by supercomputer. So everyone is different. And so we took a rendering of it. And we allowed you to put those ceiling tiles on your own ceiling and then see, as our, an acoustical engineer showed us it would, how the sound waves bounce off and why that makes the sound rich. In the middle example, we did a story on all of the UNESCO travel sites. There are 23 of them in the United States. And we did Yellowstone and Monticello. We built out as AR experiences. And you can bring a room scale, a full-size American bison, into your room and then hear from our travel writer about why that makes Yellowstone so special. And we even made a game about the Winter Olympics, where you can race different athletes. So you can see who's faster, a downhill skier or a bobsledder. And the whole idea here is that we're using AR not to have a Pokemon Go experience where you wander around Miami and run into news, but that we can bring details from the stories to life, bring virtual elements into your space, and make the news consumption experience much more compelling. 
And so for the post, the most important thing for us is that we're trying to maintain our heritage as a news organization that is absolutely committed to telling crucial stories, difficult to find stories, but also a news organization that's dedicated to infusing technology in everything we do. And so this was on the, um, back in April when the Pulitzers were announced and the Post won, won two for basically investigative journalism. And we were thrilled as an organization, but we're equally thrilled about the ability that we have to tell stories differently and reach audiences differently because of technology. And without those two things, none of this would have been possible. So thank you very much. I believe we have some time for questions. So, okay, so the question is about monetization and especially around, um, you know, different ways that stories are presented to you. So for the post, one, we're a private company, so while I would love to share lots of details, I really can't, but I can talk to you about what the sources of our revenue are. So obviously, I mentioned the ARC piece, licensing of the content management system, that helps. Um, obviously, the print newspaper is still pretty lucrative. There are valuable print ads, subscriptions are relatively, not expensive, but more than people pay digitally, typically. Uh, there are digital subscriptions. That's been, in the last year or two, a really important source of revenue. And then there are a whole variety of different ad formats. So uh, Outbrain and other companies like it, we, we do use one. Um, one of the things you can do is write lots of rules around which kinds of stories you will take. So we're not looking for stories that are represented by scantily clad people, or um, uh, there are lots of really bad ones. It's not my favorite source of revenue, but it is a source of revenue. Um, there are display ads, and those are really divided between direct sold and programmatic. Uh, we have gotten much better about programmatic. The secret for us for programmatic was that if your site loads really slowly because your tech is bad, programmatic is not a great source of revenue, and you get terrible ads at low prices. If your site loads really quickly, you can hold an auction, and you can hold out for better ads at higher prices. So it's possible to be successful with programmatic. And then there's branded content. Um, well, there's something in between, but there's branded content where we have a team. So the main editorial newsroom is in Washington. The brand studio, as we call it, is in New York. And those people are writing very clearly labeled stories on behalf of clients, sponsors. And then we do some ad technology that we actually license as well. I think really the critical thing with all of these different sources of revenue is making very clear what are you doing editorially versus what are you doing because it's paid. If that's not clear, and it, you, know, you may tell me it's not clear on the Washington Post, we need to do better then. But I think if you are clear about it, all of these are good ways to help subsidize important journalism at the local and national and international level. But you have to do it in a way, I think, that doesn't diminish reader trust. That's really the critical thing. There was another question over here? Right. I, so as far as new technologies and their incorporation into the journalism that we do, it's, it is difficult. So it really is a, a multi-step process. One, you have to do a lot of scouting, and you have to, you can't have a small handful of people who are responsible for all of the exciting things that you do. So you have to have almost everyone thinking it is their job to understand when they see a new technology that might be applicable. Because without that, that's really difficult. The second thing is, you have to be able to create space within their daily jobs to do some of this experimentation. If everyone's job is so closely tied to the absolute necessities of production, then you're not going to be able to do some of this experimentation. So we have been lucky that we've been able to add to our newsroom, so we've been able to take some people out of some daily responsibilities to do some of this ad hoc innovation. And then the third thing is, frankly, you have to be fairly ruthless about what works and what doesn't work. So what I mean is, for example, we were pretty excited a couple years ago to do a VR story. We didn't probably do it the perfect way, there was very little audience for it because few people had headsets. And so we had to say, well, you know what? That's not a great use of our energy and time right now. We're actually coming back to it because Oculus Go and some of the other things are changing enough that maybe it could be compelling now. But we had to be honest with ourselves and say, even though we love the story, the audience wasn't there. The technology wasn't ready. So we're constantly evaluating. AR, the first time we did it, it was a huge flop. And so then it wasn't until we had the ability to embed the right frameworks in our native apps that people were already using that it finally made sense. And then finally, we do try to think about revenue. So I don't know if any of you would consider yourselves in advertising, either in an agency or a couple people. Um, a lot of our ad clients want never been done befores. And so there is some financial value to the experimentation we do because it's also an opportunity to get something directly sponsored by someone who really wants to be associated with something new and novel. Was there a question back there? 
I mean, there are a couple of really concrete and tangible changes. If any of you are regular Washington Post registered users, paid subscriber or not, you can download all of the data that we have about you, about what stories you read. There's not, I don't know if you downloaded your Facebook data. It's not like that, frankly. We just don't have that volume of data about you. But we do know what you've read. And I think that's an important part of, for us, making better recommendations about stories you might want. Uh, a second thing that we did is we are, you know, as everyone should be, GDR, GDPR compliant. Uh, one of the things that we've offered, not in the States yet, but in Western Europe, which is interesting, is we have a subscription that's at a standard US-based price, and you opt in to certain analytics gathering. And then we have a more expensive subscription where you opt out of that, and we don't show you ads, and we don't show you analytics trackers. And it's an experiment. We don't know if there'll be interest enough to pay this higher rate, or if we charge too little or too much, but we'll figure it out. I do think eventually, uh, if privacy laws go the direction they're trending in the states, we may offer something comparable here for people who want to opt out. Um, it's going to be really interesting. I think the European publishers in particular are in a tough spot because they haven't always been completely forthcoming about where their revenue is coming from. User data is incredibly valuable. If you don't acknowledge that and you didn't tell your audience that, then suddenly when it's not available unless you opt in, it's difficult. This certainly is changing the way publishers communicate. But I think, at least for the post, right now, it's not going to drastically change what we do, but it's certainly something we're thinking about. There's a question over here. So in, as technology has changed, and certainly the pace, the cadence of news gathering has shot up tremendously, how do we gauge whether stories are working and when we should invest what kinds of technology into them? Fair summation? You know, it's tricky. There are different things, but I would say to some degree it depends on the journalist. So David Farenthold, who uh, covered the Trump foundation, the philanthropy that the Trump family ran. Uh, in a lot of cases, because his audience was so socially savvy, he credited in his Pulitzer Prize acceptance speech individual Twitter users by name who helped him with his, report, with his reporting, that in that case, often we tweeted whatever we had because that's what his audience expected. In other cases, the long two-part two project we did with um, Obama, President Obama and Russia and President Trump and Russia in those cases, we held on to the investigative work we had until it was ready for all platforms. So it depends on whether we think we're likely to get scooped by someone else. That still matters to us. Being first with new information matters. It also depends on how long the story is. You know, if you really have a very short but important story, get it out there as fast as you can. If you have a story that's going to take people a while to consume, investing in the, the consumption experience, the way it's designed, the way it's formatted, that matters a lot. That makes a big difference. Sometimes we miss. But when we do, we try to figure out what we can learn from that. Uh, let me go back there, and then I'll go over here and over here. Yes? This is a conversation we've had a lot of. What I can tell you right now a lot about. So it would ARC, our content management system, is it open source or would it ever be? Right now it is not. Um, we do have a number of college publishers who use the platform for free. But as of now, we are only signing up, signing up paying clients. and. Everything is, I can't think of any individual component even that is published open source, but there are a lot of conversations about it. Do you have a question? How do we market the post? I would say not as effectively as we would like. It's been, it, frankly, it was just not something that we thought of. I mean, if you watched the Super Bowl or the Grammys, you saw ads for our competitors up in New York, and um, I think they're very savvy about how they market. We do some advertising a little bit. Um, both Facebook and Google have tried to work with us in helping us identify people who might be paid digital subscribers. There isn't a marketing campaign that talks about truth or democracy for the Washington Post. It's not because we don't necessarily want to. We just haven't done it. And it, until recently, frankly, it just wasn't a big focus. But I think it's an area that we can do more and better in. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, it's painful. So why is he missing all of the cool stuff that I, that I worked on and I showed? Um, yeah, that hurts. Um, no, I mean, it is a problem. It's a problem in, in the same way that you think about, I don't know if any of you feel this way, but you look a year later and there was some amazing film or some book you didn't read that you wish you had. Like, I think we have a bit of a problem because we have this high volume, which we're, we think that the volume and cadence is really important to the people who want news. We love the curated email newsletters that you get in the morning. We think those are very successful. We're not always as thoughtful as we should be about how do we get the longer form, longer lasting, still impactful journalism in front of people. Uh, we published a Sunday Magazine story about Lorraine Powell Jobs, Steve Jobs' widow, who's doing really amazing things, um, among other things, transforming the Atlantic Magazine, Atlantic Monthly. 
Um, not as many people saw that story as they should. We need to find other ways because the, the news cycle, we're really good at the ever-changing news cycle, and we're struggling a little bit more with how do we get those other stories out there. It's just something we have to work on. Uh, yes, and then over there. Uh, so what's the roadmap for these psychographically, demographically based communities or some of these other verticals that we're creating? I think you'll see more of them, frankly. I mean, that's, it's not to say that there aren't more people we can reach in the United States with our general news product. Uh, I think there are certainly some more. And Comscore numbers are only are most reliable as a comparison to other publications. You assume that the margin of error is probably the same for everybody, hopefully. Uh, but if we're reaching somewhere between one out of five and one out of three people in this country who can speak English and who can read and are probably of age, then there is room for growth, but there's not a ton of room for growth. So there's some international growth for us, but there's also a lot of growth by segmentation. So we think, for example, Twitch is one area where we can start to reach some people who maybe otherwise wouldn't have thought about us. So some of it is about new platforms, some of it is about new topics, some of it is about what can we do with demographic targeting. I think there's a lot more we can do, and certainly a lot of the most compelling ideas that are getting investment internally, meaning time, technology, money, are ideas that are in those community-based areas. You know, it'll be interesting to see, it, what, what we'll want to look at is over two or three years, how are these new communities doing? Are they all equally successful? Does it mean that the strategy works for everything or are they successful because they are successful at those areas? So we just don't know yet, it's too early. So how have the algorithmic changes at Facebook affected the visibility of our news stories in your news feed? The answer is definitely. Uh, the thing that was interesting is that we saw the changes I, before they were reported. And we almost immediately went to Facebook and said, hey, something is going on. You know, our percentage of traffic from Facebook is way down from where it was. By the time they announced it, we had sort of leveled out. Um, by the time they said, we're going to put fewer news stories in your feed, they had already done it in, in our case. I don't know about everything. And I don't have a lot of internal knowledge about that. What I will say that has done is it has been really good. Like anyone who has lived through a stock market crash, you do a better job of distributing your retirement income in different places. Like we now use different channels in different ways to gain an audience. Um, I, would I like lots more traffic from Facebook? Sure. Do I feel like we've gotten to a pretty good place where it's okay that there's not as much traffic from Facebook? I think also yes, because the traffic we do get from Facebook now feels more valuable because it's often coming from people you know rather than just from liking a page. So that I think has been helpful, that people do are more likely to engage with shared links. There are just fewer of them that appear, but it certainly has changed the way we relate and has forced us to be much more balanced in, in where we participate. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it.